So, how are you guys doing? Welcome. Um, my name is Jared Patel. I'm actually the DevOps Manager at SAP and S2. Um, we also have JP Robinson, who's our Senior uh, Automation Engineer, and Roberto Ortiz, who's our, one of our Senior Sysadmins. Um, today we're going to go over a little bit of how at NS2 in our cloud, our new cloud offerings, we're bringing velocity and compliance into an environment that's generally not been known for that sort of thing. Um, to start with a little bit of backstory um, with how SAP NS2 came about. SAP NS2 is actually a wholly owned subsidiary of SAP. Um, we exist to service the US public sector from state and local government to fed civ agencies, to DOD, and the intelligence community. So what we do is we can take all of SAP's products, all of its know-how, all of its development, tooling, and bring that to the cloud for the federal government and the space inside. Um, we are fully US-based. And so the next question is, what does DevOps mean at NS2? So DevOps can mean a lot of different things, and especially within a compliancy space. The first thing we looked at when we were building our environment was, how do we do this as infrastructure as code? As a lot of you guys know, as we build with our infrastructures, we want to make sure that it's repeatable, it's something that you can actually take and transport from environment to environment. One of the big key factors we had was, we actually have to work in air-gapped environments, meaning we may not see what the end environment ends up being. We have to build something and say, hand it over to somebody and say, here, you take it, you have to run it. So we need to be able to take, make sure everything's codified and standardized so we can move it through. Which then brings us to how we actually approach that. We said, if we're doing this as code, let's apply the same methodologies that we're doing for our software development to our infrastructure and platform development. So we can say platform 1.0, 2.0, let's move that through. Um, next thing is a big thing we have at DevOps at NS2 is we actually are responsible for ingesting all of the code and all of the products we have from our parent company, SAP, and bringing it in and making it work in a compliant environment. A lot of these things are commercial off-the-shelf products that were never designed to run in an environment where it's air-gapped, where you don't have internet, you can't integrate with 16 other systems to get your data. You can't deploy from one side of the country to the other. You sometimes have to be physically plugged into those networks. So how do you take all of these things and package it together and move it around? That's one of our big questions. And so a lot of times when people hear compliancy and DevOps in the government space, you're wrong. Because most times you hear it and go, that, that doesn't make sense. How does the government do that? Government and the public sector in the compliance environment is very slow. So what we want to do is let's see if we can make this process faster. There has to be a better way. Let's bring some of the tech we have on the commercial sides and the open source world and bring that into the public sector for the government and say, let's take it forward. So we're going to cover a little bit of how does that work for us. So how are we taking all of this big SAP enterprise software? A lot of this stuff is huge. SAP ERP is huge. Business Objects is huge. HANA is huge. How do you take all of these things and put them in an environment where, one, you may not have access. Two, it's, sometimes it's a physical build in some data center somewhere. Sometimes it's Amazon. You don't know where it's actually the end platform is going to end up being. The next thing is, how do we do that at scale? These environments are massive. They can end up being thousands of servers. How do you ensure compliancy and making sure things are built correctly throughout the environment at those scales? Next thing we'll cover is how we're actually utilizing chef provisioning and chef delivery to actually get us there, get us that velocity. How, is, how are these tools actually helping us do what we need to do? So the first thing we'll cover is some of the challenges that we have in with our enterprise software. It's big, it's unwieldy. There's hundreds of servers. One of our application stacks, and you'll see in a little bit, is about 100 servers, bare minimum, how to install it for a SaaS application. That's a lot of servers, that's a lot of config, and each and every one has to be there just for the application to work. The other big thing is, is because we are still sourcing our software from SAP, our teams are spread out across the world. SAP has development teams wherever you look. All of this code is coming in. How are we ingesting all of this? How are we taking this and packing it together? Um, and that, and that which then leads to, our dev teams aren't always necessarily connected to ops. 
your developers may get to work on their development machines, but they don't get to see what the end machine is because of the way our compliance and the FedRAMP policies work. You may not have access to those environments. So how do you build something that you can hand over to a sysadmin and say, here you go, deploy it. Next big thing is compliance and security at scale. So the first thing is, how many of you guys have heard of what FedRAMP is? Good chunk of you. NIST 800-53, let's see if, who's got that going. Next fun one, FIPS 140-2. Who's a fan of FIPS 140-2? Chris, you don't count. <laughs> All of these things you got to bring together and actually build an environment for that. What we said is, okay, we've accepted that. We said, okay, we have to run this secure environment. How are we going to do it? What we looked at it said, okay, well, let's not look at it as a limiting factor. Let's see how we can actually work towards it and put it in at the front so that we're not having to deal with it on the back end of the system's already built. Now let's put security on top. When you look at it that way, it really helps us build things much quicker because as you're looking at it going, is this going to work in a secure environment? Has this been tested in a secure environment? If you're doing that in dev, you save a lot of headache when you get to prod. Obviously, the next thing, how do you do it at scale? How do you move that around? Velocity. It's how do you take all of this stuff and move it across? So you have your configurations, your security groups, your firewalls. How do you make sure all these machines talk to each other? And then the next big thing we have is at least because of we have air-gapped environments, there's multiple security boundaries. You may not necessarily see the end systems. You have to move things around. Systems themselves inside of their own data center may not be able to talk to each other except for maybe one or two ports through a specific route, through a specific firewall. You're not allowed to just say, I just want to give me a greenfield environment, let's put everything on VPC and hit the button. It doesn't work. The way we looked at it said, we can actually take this environment, put it together in a platform, and say, let's move all of this together. So, STIGs. How many of you guys have worked with STIGs? How many of you guys know how to do a STIG or have seen a STIG before? All right. Who thinks a STIG is the guy who drives around a racetrack in a white suit and doesn't talk anymore? Yeah, not that guy. <laughs> Sorry to burst your bubble. STIGs will actually, I'll go out and say, they'll break your system. That's what they're designed to do. So how do you take all of these stakes and apply them in an environment that works? How do you standardize all of that and say, how do I make my apps take all of this stuff and stigs look, you know, for OS applications and appliances, they look very different. They have very specific configs. For those of you unfamiliar, this is sort of what one looks like, right? So this is off of Stig Viewer, which is a very great website if you haven't seen it. Actually, puts it together in a great website to say, here's my, go look up a Red Hat stig, here's what everything you need to do. For example, this is no exec on slash temp. If you give this to a Red Hat admin, they're gonna know, go change that CFS tab and job done. It's one of these little standard things, but as we looked at it as Chef developers, we're like, well, that's a config file on a server. Chef can do that, right? Why not just make all of this Chef? Which then brings us to how do you take all of these things and put it together? The next big problem we had were our boundaries. We have our environments that are physically and logically separated. Uh, this breaks a lot of things of, okay, you built it out in dev, how do you move it to prod? Sometimes that means taking your package, tarring it up, putting it on a CD, and saying, send this to the data center, have someone load it. Or walk it across, because they're air gap. You can't just move stuff across, which in a lot of cases you see that, well, that's going to slow me down. How do I make that work? What you'll see when we go through delivery is you'll actually see how we've taken that process and made something that's portable enough to go through these environments. The next big thing, especially as DevOps and full stack engineers, we all get to touch a little bit of everything. FedRAMP and the way the DOD works is we work off a of policy of least privilege. You only get access to what you need to get to and very minimal, so your DBAs only have access to just the database. Not the OS underneath, just the database. Your OS engineers may only have access to the underlying Red Hat, not necessarily the application running on top. So they may not be able to troubleshoot. Your application folks can only look at the app, don't know, can't see the database, and 
sometimes can't even look at the OS. You have a lot of cross-functional just mess there when you start doing the least privileges. The way we looked at it with Chef was let's see if we can streamline this process a bit and if we can automate a lot of these builds and task things, the people looking at the applications only have to worry about just the app piece. They don't have to worry, well, was it installed correctly? Is it configured correctly? Does the OS look like how it's supposed to look like? So that came, so the first point we come to is how do we take that and look at it as compliancy for code? As we're building our infrastructure as code, as we're developing all of our environments, how do we take that and move it across? So the first thing is all our code has to follow through these processes. So there has to be documentation, design docs, all put together before when you're submitting to auditors as a part of the policy package. And what we've actually settled on was Chef Delivery, which JP will actually go into in a little bit, actually now. JP? So hi, I'm JP Robinson. Um, I've worked on most of our delivery pipeline. And one of the things that we do with it is, it is our change control process. Um, where we're talking about system delivery and software delivery life cycle, it is everything that we are doing with, from changes in code that need to be made, from changes on systems that need to be made, all the way to our provisioning and how it needs to be changed. If we do a provisioning change, it has to walk through the delivery life cycle. Um, the other part of it is things like uh, third-party cookbooks from the supermarket. Because of our requirements, we have to basically fork those manually, put them through our compliancy guidelines, and run them through our change control, and any changes that we then pull down after that point also have to run through the same process. Um, it allows us to basically do continuous integration. However, our change control requirements are not easy, they are complicated. So basically this is delivery's model. Um, for those of you who are not familiar, how many are running delivery? How many of you are running some other CI or CD system? Okay, some of you. Um, so basically you start with your pull request for any code change that needs to be made. That goes through in delivery. The intended way is it gets reviewed, it runs through basic syntax checks, and a basic unit test. Once it's approved by a reviewer, it then moves on and is merged and goes into what delivery calls its acceptance stage. For most of you who are familiar with delivery, this is where your dev environment would be. This is where you would do most of your acceptance testing before moving it on into union rehearsal and production, which are slightly different, but ultimately once you press that deliver button, it's there in production. Um, as long as your tests pass, it will go through right into production. However, as we've already talked about a little bit, we have disconnected production environments. Nothing necessarily talks to each other. Some of them, as Shirag indicated, we can't even see. Um, we have to basically hand it off and say, here you go, go deploy it, and they'll come back to us with any problems they had. Um, redacted problems that they had. Um, the requirements are we also have to pass from a dev stage to a QA, to a stage environment, to production. Each of those has different people who have to sign off on who gets to say, you know, okay, yes, it's good to move to, from dev to QA. That would be Shirag. After that, it's somebody totally different and then different again to move into stage, and different to move into production. And actually that last part, the production sign-off, also requires our customer to say, yes, we accept the code that's in stage, and you are now ready to move into production. So, very complicated. We also have a minimum delay of a week in each stage, and that's by contract, and also by regulations. We can't move code once it moves into that stage, for a week at least. So that uh, slows us down a bit, whereas we're trying to move very quickly. So part of what we do here, we modified the delivery life cycle. Uh, we took apart the delivery truck cookbook, which is what delivery uses to move through each of its stages. And we basically had to take it apart, put it back together to meet our needs. So in our dev environment, we have a pull request that comes in, of course. 
We then pass it through the normal delivery pipeline, and the dev environment is where it ends up delivering to. So that's basically where that stops. We then have a second part, which is our promotion request. When we've certified that dev is ready to go, we create this promotion request, which also runs through delivery, but what we did is we modified the delivery cookbook to take the versions that we've certified in dev to actually create a promote, it promotes it and creates a environment file that has all of the version numbers it creates a tar file with all of the cookbooks, and then it has to sign all of that because with each of the environments, when it crosses those boundaries, we have to say that what's going out is what's coming in. It's all very complicated, but delivery was flexible enough to allow us to do this with some modification to the delivery truck code. Um, outside of that, once all that is packaged up and ready, we put in the change request. The change request goes to whoever approves moving it onto the next stage. They approve it, and then it's uploaded into that environment, whether that's passing off the CD and somebody loads it physically, whether that's an SFTP transfer, however that needs to go, to cross that air gap. Once it crosses that air gap, they kick off a Chef Zero cookbook that was included in this package that basically uploads all of the cookbooks, ingests all of the environment versions, and pins them for each of the environments on each any chef servers that are in that production environment. It's a little bit complicated, but we've had to kind of work within what requirements were there. Um, and delivery, like I said, has been very good and very flexible in allowing us to do this the only part that's really manual at this point is kicking off that Chef Zero cookbook. Once it's kicked off, it's delivered. If we need to roll back, it's very easy to kick off a promotion request with the previous version's cookbooks, and it will roll it back for us as well. So after that, I'm going to pass it back to Shrog. So that was a little bit of how we were using the delivery for our application deployments and how we're actually automating up with the compliancy for the code. So the next big hurdle we experienced was going through our entire FedRAMP build process was all of our environment has to be put into a baseline that gets submitted to the auditors to say, hey auditors, this is our environment, here's how it looks, here's the baseline, and how it's getting been put together. That includes all of our instances, the security groups, the VPCs, appliances, the, the kitchen sink even. It's, if you've seen the FedRAMP documentation, it's can you get into the building all the way down to the bits on the server. It's a real soup to nuts facility, the whole thing. So how are we putting this all together? How are we standardizing all this stuff? Luckily there's a pretty awesome tool that lets us do that. We've decided to just go ahead and chef it all. If it's there, chef it. Um, this includes just building machines, how we actually put together our environments, how everything is tied together. Let's just say, okay, we got the app, cool. Does the server build? I need to build it by hand. No, let's go back, make sure you write a chef recipe to go do that. Make sure chef is actually doing all the work that we need to do to standardize this environment. At which point you can then say, this is environment 1.0, stamp it out, package it up, send it wherever other environment you need to go to. So with all that put together, just to see how complex this environment looks, this is actually an architecture diagram for just one of our applications. Um, it's ridiculously complex. I'm not even gonna try explaining it because that's probably another three days of talking to you. Um, but just really quickly, it's just everything, every box that you see, the big colored ones, that's a different security boundary, a different security posture. Every one of those little ones you see are actually servers of web servers, app servers, database servers, and they're all clustered HA. This ends up being 100 servers just for a minimum high availability stack. So putting that all together, building that and making sure it's all orchestrated is the next big hurdle we, we faced. And the way we actually started looking at how we're gonna fix that or how we're gonna tackle this problem was chef provisioning. 
And to go into that a little bit, I will invite Roberto up here to actually start with that. Thanks, Sharon. Good. Yeah, you're good. Awesome. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Roberto Ortiz, and I'm going to talk to you about how we utilize chef provisioning within NS2. Um, but before I do that, I want to explain why is it that we utilize chef provisioning. NS2 Cloud is a fairly new organization within SAP. Um, and with that, we were given a task to essentially grab a suite of large applications and put them in the cloud. And especially a Gov Cloud. So, what we need to find out how to do is, how do we deploy these large number of servers? How is it that all these special little snowflake servers are essentially get transferred and, and um, essentially they get transferred as cattle? So that was one of our challenges that we had to do. SAP was gracious enough to give us cookbooks to be able to deploy some of these applications, which was a great head start for us as we needed it. But to do so, we also needed to figure out a way to deploy these servers. So many of you work within AWS, and some of you probably work within AWS GovCloud. So Chirag and myself started working by deploying a server at a time, one by one by one by one. That gets tedious, fast, especially when we start blasting them um, something doesn't work with the actual cookbook for, actually to, um, for it to actually be deployed correctly. So that became a problem. So how do we tackle this problem of multiple servers being deployed? Chef provisioning. Chef provisioning gave us the ability um, and filled the requirements that were needed for us, which were it had to be flexible enough to be extended. It had to be fluid enough to be able to transpire between those multiple air gap environments. And so the second thing was managing all these, essentially hurting all these cats, right? Getting all these applications, getting them all to work, you know, essentially smoothly and together, which was, <laughs> needless to say, a pain. And lastly, but most importantly, security. And being as a SAP National Security Services, that is our number one priority making sure that our client, that every single one of our applications, our infrastructure is deployed and it's compliant and it's secure. So, Chef Provisioning filled all these things. We had to figure out a way to essentially get all these recipes to work together for each one of our applications. So we had to extend some libraries to be able to communicate with other things, other components of our network. You know, being able to talk and Utilize AWS infrastructure is great. ELBs, easy. EBS volumes, pretty good. But how do you do it when you got to talk to F5s? When you got to talk to info blocks, right? You got to extend that. So Chef provisioning gave us that ability because at its core, it's fantastic for building machines. But to be able to utilize it for our use, we had to extend it, add libraries, add resources, and so that's essentially how Slatchup came to be. Slatchup for us is our master provisioning cookbook. It contains everything that we use to deploy every single application, every single security group, every single VPC, we utilize it. And so, Slapchop has given us, essentially, the, it's the backbone of our entire infrastructure and our model. The first thing is, it's flexibility. As I mentioned earlier, and as Chirag mentioned earlier, we have multiple environments, so we have to be able to make the code portable enough to be able to move from place to place to place to place, right? And so with Slapchop and of course Chef Provisioning, it gives us that tool, right? It gives us the ability to increase on that core set of things that it can do, right? We can grab machines and we can start building on top of that, right? We need to have a way to deploy a full stack of applications. I mean, the entire spectrum, from the DB all the way up to the edge VPC, I mean, to the edge firewall, right? So that was one of its core values, and that's why we utilize it. The biggest one for us at that particular time was figuring out a way to make these apps work together, right? I mean, that's a challenge. You know, as, as you saw in the diagram earlier, we have hundreds of apps, hundreds of things working 
together, and these things are huge. I mean, it's, it's hard for us to be able to do so. So we ran into the experience that, you know, we, get, we got the code, great. Now, how do we do this? We started deploying things. When we started doing this, it took us up to a week, you know, or possibly longer to be able to run and create this code and to be able to deploy our applications. So we had to figure out a way to bring that down. Chef provisioning allowed us to do that. It brought, it brought the capabilities to be able to essentially bring down that week long of time down to a matter of minutes, right? And I mean that by one of our largest application, right? It contains roughly 120 some servers, give or take, right? That comes from them, you know, the DB, HANA, application, web, right? How do you make that happen? With Chef provisioning. Mostly because we were able to put everything in machine batches, be, essentially be able to orchestrate the way that these applications are being deployed, right? We bring in the DB, boom, we got HANA installed. It's ready to go, it's rock and roll, and we use it with chip provisioning. After that, we need to make sure that the applications are running. We install Tomcat, we install Java, great, that's awesome. What's next? We have our proxies. So all those little things that we need to utilize, chef provisioning gave us those tools and gave us those capabilities to bring down and to be essentially be able to deploy this humongous application down to essentially 45 minutes. We take a break, espressos, good. We're good and we come back and we're ready, the application's ready to roll. We make sure that um, our admins are able to deploy this very easily and seamlessly. So, how does it tie in with our cycle of delivery, right? Provisioning and delivery essentially were meant to be because once we had the cookbook, once we had the code, our actual infrastructure's code, how do we deliver this? How do we make this happen? Provisioning gave us that by being able to tie in the code that we can go through and test every single time and we build servers and we test them. That gave us the ability to do so and so delivery was the obvious choice once we got it working. So JP and I and Chirag worked together to make sure that that was happening every single time, every single layer. So, how is that good for us? Because it standardizes everything that we build. Every single application we deploy, we know that it is the exact same application every single time. Something happens to it, we build it again. Happens, we need to extend the load, we do it again, and we build it more. Being able to put this in the code has helped us keep our velocity to essentially increase our speed of deploying all these applications for our customers into a more streamlined way. So, we tie that back to our security model. How do we make that happen easily and smoothly? As Chirag mentioned, we have to walk into um, essentially auditors, right? I don't know if anybody has ever been in an audit before. It's a blast. And so when that happens, you, you're asked all these questions. How, how do you maintain all your applications? How do you know that your actual uh, security groups are in check? All we have to say really is just shut because our code is there. Our code reflects as to exactly how we want to deploy this, how we say we deploy it. So by being able to do that and show them the code, being able to um, give them those lines of code has helped us tremendously in making our audits easier. And so that comes back to our security folks, right? Our security folks are fantastic. They love to say no to everything. Oh, hey, we want to do this. I uh, know. So that's a problem. But with Chef Provisioning, we have been able to essentially give them a tool where they can be able to maintain everything, being able to um, ensure that remediation and ensure that everything that we have said that we're going to do, it's there. So at any point, for example, uh, as a real world example that we currently use, we use security groups and we manage that through the recipe, right? So every now and then, we have to test some things. So what happens? This admin decides to, hey, I'm gonna open up this port. Awesome. But guess what? He opened uh, port 22 on 0000. Awesome, dude. That's great. The problem is, of course, that falls out of compliance. That falls out of our spectrum of the world. So by being able to, for example, grab one of these recipes, put it in a provision node, we are able to put that in and it runs continuously, right? So he changed that open. Now we can make sure provisioning, put it back in place. So we don't have to worry about, oh no, what happened to one of our nodes or what happened to one of these ports? Chef provisioning puts it back. That has helped us tremendously. And so, you know, use chef provisioning. It's fantastic. 
I want to pick a next chair. So, I can really quickly go to how does this fit together? So, we've taken provisioning and delivery and put that into our environment. So, we've taken provisioning as a cookbook and said, well, if it's a cookbook, let's deliver it like we deliver everything else, which is our delivery process. So merging these two together have actually helped us really accelerate how quickly we do these, do our FedRAMP builds, get everything through. We've taken a process that was originally estimated for us to take up to three years, two years, which is uh, from our, VP, our director Jeremy here, um, that's taken two years down to six months. So we've definitely been able to move faster. The next step is our future state. With products like InSpec and Compliance, we can tie that directly to the platform we've built because they're actually built with delivery and chef in mind. So we can add that in at the front. So as all these things are going in, we can put in all the cool stuff that we get with InSpec, all the stuff we're getting with compliance, directly into the pipeline and just have it flow directly in. And so with that, I'd like to thank you for coming out, listening to how we've worked things out with Chef at NS2. And we'll actually open up to a few questions. All right. Uh, so the chef community has a, a bit of a reputation for being a you know a sharing community, uh, which can be sometimes challenging in this space. Yes. Um, are you aware of anybody who has sort of put out a collection of cookbooks that might help you with 853 compliance? Like a, uh, I want Tomcat, but I'd like to set up a Tomcat where I can just throw a WAR file at it and have it be, if not you know all the way 853 compliant at least as much as possible from just like the base Tomcat setup. So that's been a difficult point for us as well because we looked in the community, there's not much out there. Um, I will say there is a cookbook from USGS around Stigs that will actually get at least the base OS there. Um, I believe it's, it was actually built around Red Hat. We actually brought that in and adapted it for us, but that's sort of the starting point we had to go from. Um, our applications they're almost always a little different. So we're looking at ways to package that together. Um, out in the community, we're still looking. Um, we're open to listen. Um, I think at, as we evolve, I think we may actually start giving back and putting some of this out there saying, hey, you guys can use some of this stuff we've got. Uh, one of the, one of the um, things that you'd mentioned was when you showed the uh, security people your code and they actually went through it line by line with you and saw that it was do it, securing the things that it was supposed to do and they approved it. Did you all have any problems with uh, them asking for proof that that was actually the case? And how did you provide the metrics? So actually, yes, that's part of our artifact gathering. So a lot of that stuff we did live with the, the auditors where they came into the office, we sat down, plugged into the laptop and said, here, take a look at this. And you know, sometimes we went through and actually caused some something that was supposed to be wrong and said here watch what chef's going to do and within we just kicked off a chef run and said here's what it was before you can see the security hole your screenshots to it we're going to run chef and here's a screenshot afterwards and that actually was pretty sufficient for them the other side of that is we also hooked all of this into analytics which is feeding this data into splunk so you can easily generate a splunk report or splunk alert saying hey this was out of line i fixed it yeah. I kind of had a similar question to that. So, um, as especially when dealing with auditors or security people or anything, a lot of times when I try to bring a chef into an organization, there's a lot of just immediate fear about the idea of dealing with code for anything. Um, so I was wondering if you guys had any uh, resistance either with the external auditors or with your internal teams on um, putting their faith in letting their systems be secured by a chef. Um, initially, I believe we did. I'm actually going to bring Jeremy in to answer a little bit of that. Um, he was actually there actually <laughs> helping us evangelize this for us. Yeah, so early on, we did have quite a bit of resistance with that. Um, a lot of people don't understand what it means to actually codify the infrastructure. They don't understand what you mean by it. They also don't understand what that means for security. So it's more of a fear of the unknown. Uh, once we started actually showing them, one thing we did was we brought Chef in. Um, when Chef comes in and actually shows them, the security team, guys, this is what's going to happen. Here's the standardization. When you start running through NIST 800-53, uh, you're looking at the CM group, you can start showing how you can build baselines.
can build standardization, and you can build change control all through Chef, right? And it looks much better than it does when you're trying to build individual systems. So you can actually show right there to the security team, I mean, in probably about a one-hour demo, how their life just went from this to this, right? You can also show your executive management how you can consolidate. Consolidate teams, consolidate security, and consolidate how you pump out the documentation that you need around security. Go ahead. All right. So, so what, when you guys started this project to now, what were the big things that you thought, you know, that you thought you understood, and that you now wish you knew? You wish you knew now that you didn't know then. FIPS is fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, that that was one of the major things that was a, a, a big stumbling block for us because of a lot of the way Ruby works and the way we're developing code. If you run stuff in a FIPS environment, especially with SSL and how things work, knowing now what we did, it's we 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 should have been a little bit more prepared for that. Where we're deploying things, we're getting things working, and then halfway through we turned on FIPS and everything fell down, and we're like, well, what the hell's going on? Up to and including Chef, and so there were a lot of tickets into Chef going, uh, guys, a little help. So. That one was a big one. So keeping in mind that when you run in a FIPS environment and run with the STIGs, it's, those things are designed to break the system. And just because that's how they said, you know, if you need this to be secure, you can't do these X, Y, Z. So you then have to actually put together that, that mitigation of here's why we need it and here's how we're protecting against any other holes that we may open up as a result. And having that, knowing that now, early on, I think we should have what we know now is we should have brought in more security at the beginning. And so, and at least now with tools out there, inspect being in a pretty good state now, inspect bringing it in earlier is definitely what I would suggest. If you're starting out, start looking at inspect now. Two things about the uh, FIPS thing. So obviously after we call Chef uh, several times, uh, they gather a group of people and they put them in the FIPS team. So ask the Chef guys, Who's in the FIPS team? And uh, I'm sure they'll answer that question for you. Or run away screaming. Yeah, <laughs> one of the two may happen. So, so I have a question about, um, can you tell me about access to your cookbooks? Like who has access to them in your organization and how the auditors <laughs> responded to the access so to the cookbooks? The way we did that, we actually do keep it open inside our organization. We, we work off of, we have all of our code checked into our internal GitHub enterprise instance. So we say, hey, anybody can go submit a pull request. If, if you think that you need, there's something wrong in the chef code or in the code somewhere, go submit a change. You're empowered to go do that. The way we then control it from production and upwards or moving it out of dev is we work through pull requests, code reviews, and the delivery process. So we have a, a specific team inside the core DevOps group that's actually responsible for code reviews and looking at all of that. But what we've said is anybody in the org is actually open to go make a change. And the way we've mitigated that is we actually say we've worked through a review process and approvals before it goes up. So at least two sets of eyes are looking at the code before it leaves dev. Yeah, so let me add on to that a little bit. Um, so it's important to note the different environments. So FedRAMP will require you to split the environments out. Uh, you definitely have a, an air gap segregation between dev, QA, and production. And so when you do that, your least privileged access um, is basically kind of a high, medium, low as you move from production backwards. So you can provide more access to your developers uh, and your teams in dev, but then you have to have a process in your system delivery lifecycle as to how you actually move that code and how security does its checks and balances as the code goes through. Um, that's something that we've been using provisioning and delivery uh, to do currently, and we'll be looking to uh, expand on further. Yep. And that actually goes back to the delivery lifecycle we had, um, where we had to go across those air gaps. Um, one thing I would add to the things we wish we knew, um, I wish I knew more about delivery when we started this because the automated testing and everything it gives us saves us a whole lot of time. And just, uh, we'll get to take one last question. Are, are we done? Oh, sorry. 
So you can talk to me afterwards. We'll yeah, talk uh, about that. So we're done with questions, signs. So thank you for everyone for coming. Uh, please give a big hand to. Uh,